E pluribus unum. You may have seen this Latin phrase before. The mission statement of our great nation since its founding. The United States is often said to be a melting pot, a fusion of nationalities, cultures, and ethnicities. E pluribus unum. Out of many, one. E pluribus unum. We don't hear this phrase anymore, yet we see it at work every day all around us. Our backgrounds are diverse, but our dreams for this country all start with freedom. We all want the promise and opportunity this land offers. America is not a perfect place, but it is a land of promise. We have a good foundation from which to build. Our country is young, and there is more work to be done. The essential workers of America represent the melting pot of diversity, now more than any other time in our nation's history. We have all come together for one goal, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Regardless of race, gender, religion, or politics, when our country has needed us, we've come together. We need each other. We are stronger with each other than without. Out of many, one. 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 Many, yes. But are we one yet? We're taking another step. Unity is not achieved overnight. We must move forward toward the goal. Our purpose still calls out to us. Our national mission statement continues to beckon us forward. Out of many, one. One nation, one people, one God. The body of Christ also embodies the heart of air pluribus unum. We are like a human body. Each piece plays a critical part. God has placed each of us in this body exactly where he wants us to be. If one part of the body suffers, all parts suffer. When one part is victorious, all of us are victorious together. We may come from different backgrounds, but we have all found freedom in Christ. And we're all pursuing his great commission as one. Our church body is not perfect, but one day we will be as we gather around the throne of God. The body of Christ around the world and here at Sugar Creek continues to grow and expand and learn how to be the people of God we were created to be. Yes, E pluribus unum is a founding principle of our nation, but long before our nation was in existence, this unity was the foundation for the church. Love for each other and our fellow man fuels this unity and our oneness. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, love is the only force capable of turning an enemy into a friend. He said that because Jesus taught it. We will be the church he has called us to be. This unity defines the body of Christ and makes us different. It is part of the life change that we strive for, to be like Jesus and help others to know him and to be one in Christ as well. It is time for us to rise up. It is time for us to demonstrate our oneness. Now more than ever, those that have yet to know God's love 
need to see our love, our care for others and for each other, our selflessness, our giving, our serving, our compassion, and our unity. Out of many, one. 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 Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Didn't you enjoy that video? It was so inspiring, and I'm so grateful that you are now a part of this this service. You notice that we are online only, and we're disappointed by that, but the reason that we are is because of the spike of the COVID-19 cases in Houston. Houston has now become one of the hot spots, and in order to bless our community and help our city, we made the decision that we would go online only. Not all the, the large churches have done that, yet, but most of them have. And we've done it to protect you, but also to love our neighbor as ourself and to, be, to protect those that are around us. We don't think that that will last long. We're thinking maybe five weeks and we will be back in person in our services on August the 2nd. So we want you to come back at that time and be a part of it. Now, if the COVID cases go away quickly, we will come back sooner than that, but that's when we're anticipating. It's been wonderful today to be able to gather and to sing the songs of love and appreciation to God and about our country. We love America. We love this country. I am so grateful every day that God has given me the opportunity to be a citizen of the United States of America. But more than our love for this country or any other thing or any other person, our greatest loyalty and love is to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the God who created us and the God who called us to be in his very own family. And we have come today to worship the Lord together. Now, we have just heard in this last video maybe the phrase, uh, a pluribus unum, more than maybe we have heard in a long, long time. I actually went online to find out exactly what is the official pronunciation of that Latin phrase, and I got two different varieties that both called themselves official. So who knows exactly, I'll do my very best. A pluribus unum is actually a Latin phrase that means out of many, one. And at the beginning, it was really talking about the 13 colonies who had come together to be one nation. But as time went by, it began to morph into a greater understanding of all of the immigrants that are coming in from all over the world. We have all gathered to be one nation. I don't know of another nation that has ever existed. I don't know of another nation on the, on the planet like the United States that began the way we began. I mean, total strangers all gathering, not knowing each other, not having anything in common, but coming together to be a nation and growing that nation. It is absolutely amazing. And what it means is, that probably about 99% of us are either immigrants or we have ancestors who are immigrants, who were immigrants to the United States. In my story, my family tree comes from three different countries, from Holland and Germany and England. And we came with four or five different waves to the United States. The first wave were actually from England and they came a few decades before the Revolutionary War. And in fact, one of my ancestors fought in the Revolutionary War for America. Then there were other waves that came, these from Holland and Germany and they settled in Pennsylvania. And then the last wave I know about came from England and came all the way around and came into the United States from Galveston, Texas. Yeah, 
from Galveston, Texas, and they settled down to be Texans, and then they moved to Oklahoma, and that's my story. And every one of us have a story. In every one of our stories, there is hardship and difficulty, and for some, there is real tragedy. But all of us have a story, and all of us have come together in this country to be one nation, out of many, to be one. It's got to be the hardest way that a nation could ever be birthed, and we didn't do it all perfectly by any stretch. And in fact, the last few weeks have been a terrible, deep reminder of some of the failures that we have had in our country. But it is my hope and my prayer that God will use this time to help us to come to some new solutions that are strong but wise. Because oftentimes when we're angry and we're fearful and we're frustrated, we don't make the best decisions, but that we would make good, wise decisions. And we could be even more of the many, one. When our founding fathers gathered together to sign the Declaration of Independence, they knew that it was an act of treason against King George of England. And Benjamin Franklin stood after all the signatures had been made and he said to them, now gentlemen, we either all hang together or most assuredly, we will all hang separately. And what Benjamin Franklin was simply saying is that we've got to stick together now because if we don't, we will all die. And this country that we're trying to give birth to will tie with us. In those first few decades of American history, as I studied those decades, I, I honestly were, was stunned about how the fact that, that America made it. There were so many seemingly impossible problems to overcome. It was only by the grace of God. And there have been many times over the course of these almost 250 years that America teetered right on the edge. But somehow, some way, we, at the last moment sometimes, we came together. We reunited our hearts and we were rescued. I think one of the great reasons, the glue that kept us together in America is that there were so many men and women and teenagers who were born again followers of Jesus Christ. And when we began to go through as a country struggles and difficulties, we got on our knees and we prayed and we cried out to God, oh God, save us, oh God, rescue us. And God did. And whatever in those days, whatever the sacrifice demanded, the people in the United States, these Christ followers were willing to sacrifice even their own lives. And truly, God has blessed America. And truly, we have been one nation under God. Now we face another presidential election this fall and we face so many social issues and moral issues. There's so many, it's hard to keep up with them all. And that begins to be the dangerous place because when we're not paying attention. There can be some of these things in which wrong decisions are made and punishment comes as a result. And I'm asking you to pray. I'm asking you to pray all this, this fall as we move toward elections and decisions to pray and to seek God's word and to make decisions that are honoring to the Lord. Over the last three or four years, I, I've continued to take online courses on American history and, and video courses. I love it. I love the subject and I have continued to learn and grow. And what, what I have come to understand is that one of the great strengths of America has been the two-party system. The truth is, both parties have excesses and 
Over the decades, what has happened in America is that there has sort of been a balance that has been created by the the pushing of both of the parties against each other. Now, I know you won't hear this on any of the news stations, but there are actually good people in both parties. There are really good people in the party that you're not. And many of them are your brothers and sisters in Christ. And some are your brothers and sisters in Christ in this church. Sugar Creek is not a Democrat church. It's not a Republican church. Contrary to most other churches, we have a strong contingency of both parties that are represented in this church. And when the election is over this fall, there will be some who are elated and some who are distressed. But when all of the dust settles and all the smoke disappears, we will still be strong and unified at Sugar Creek Baptist Church because what ties us together is not politics. What ties us together is Jesus Christ. And he'll still be here when this election is over. I I heard a story the other day about a guy who was, um, who went fishing out in the Gulf of Mexico. It was a small boat, but he went out fishing and he he, uh, hooked onto a fish that was so large, it actually pulled him into the ocean. It pulled him into the water and the problem was he couldn't swim. And so you can imagine, he was afraid he was going to drown. And uh, the, the, the owner of the boat, sort of the captain of the boat, reached down and grabbed his arm to pull him back into the boat, but his arm came off. He had an artificial arm. And then he grabbed his leg and pulled it, but his leg came off because he had an artificial leg. And out of desperation, he just grabbed the man's hair, but his hair fell off because he had a toupee. And the captain said to the guy, man, if you can't stick together, I can't help you. I know how silly the joke is, but it's really true about our country and about our church. Our founding fathers understood that the only way America could survive is if it were the united States of America. And this is why Abraham Lincoln worked so hard and realized that he had no choice. There was no good solution to the Civil War but that the North would win. And no matter what it cost, no matter what it meant, the North had to win that war because it was the only hope America had. And it was the only noble solution to that war in the very same way we've got to stick together and we've got to be one God has given to us a great purpose to love and lead all people to life change in Christ to reach this region and reach this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ And at the same time, God has brought into this congregation people from 90 different countries of 70 different languages. It's the most amazing thing I have ever seen. And it was not by strategy. It was not by some design of ours. It was the hand of God himself. And he has brought us together to accomplish this great goal of loving and leading all people to life change in Christ. And it is because of that, that it is God's intention for Sugar Creek, for us also to be a pluribus unum, out of many, one. I'm talking about the unity of our church. And I am not saying that because there is disunity in the church, but but because One of our greatest strengths at Sugar Creek is the deep-seated unity that we have. It is one of our great strengths that God has brought people from every kind of language and, and place in the world 
and he has brought us together and knitted our hearts together as one. It is the one thing that Satan fears the most about our church. Jesus himself prayed that we would be united. And he said in his prayer in, in John chapter 17 that our unity would be a demonstration to all those who saw it of the validity of our gospel. It was that important to him. I'm talking about unity. Now, when I mention unity, I'm not talking about uniformity. Uniformity is when we all agree on everything. Well, that's never going to happen. No, I'm talking about unity, where God knits our hearts together. And in order for that to happen, and especially in these days we're in, It means that we have to be willing to open up our heart and hear each other because whether we want to believe it or not, most of us, maybe all of us, to one degree or another, decide where we stand on different issues on the basis of our experiences. Our experiences in life. And that's why, since we have a church of so many experiences and backgrounds, We have to hear each other. We have to open our hearts and listen to to experiences that are different from ours. We have to be willing to crawl into the skin of each other and see life from a different perspective. That's why it's so important. I don't know if you've heard this phrase before, probably you have, before you judge me, not, why not walk a mile in my moxicans? I've heard a different rendition of it, but it actually came from a poem of a woman in 1895 who wrote a poem called Judge Softly. And this line was such wisdom. Before you judge me, before you decide anything about me, How about walking a mile in my shoes? How about coming to understand me better? By coming to know who I actually am and not a stereotype of me. I think all of us have felt that from time to time. Before you judge me, before you decide something about whether I'm doing something good or or not, how about come and walk with me and understand the challenges that I face. It's about unity. When God uses the word unity, he means a oneness that is centered around Jesus and his purpose. And I wanted, I wish I would have included in that line, that statement, as understood by the word of God. Because it is God's word that directs us in all of this. Satan is no match for God and he's no match for Sugar Creek Baptist Church under God. The Bible says even the gates of hell cannot prevail against this church when we are united in Jesus Christ. And I want to talk to you about that for just a moment. I want you to imagine with me the power, the strength, and the beauty of unity. In Psalm 133 verse 1 David begins the psalm by saying, Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together, even as one. David begins this psalm in Psalm 133 with the word, Behold. It is a word that means to stop and look. Stop and look at the strength, at the beauty of unity together. Jesus made this statement in John chapter 17, verse 20, and listen to what he said. I am praying not only for these disciples, but for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Now stop for just a moment. Listen to what he's saying. I'm not just praying for the 12 disciples, my disciples. I am praying for everyone who comes to know Jesus Christ, comes to know me through their message. It means he was praying for us. He was looking down through time and he saw you, that you would receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and me, that I would receive him too. And he was praying for Sugar Creek Baptist Church. 
And what was his prayer? He says in verse 21, I pray that they may all be one. Just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and and may they be also in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. This is why our love for each other and our unity together is so critical. This unity... And this harmony grieves the Holy Spirit of God. This is why at Pentecost, the Pentecost day could not come until these disciples had been together for 10 days and they had, they had confessed their sins to God and they'd confessed their sins to each other and they had forgiven each other and their heart was cleansed because God's Spirit could not come in power until their heart was clean and until their relationships were right. It was D.L. Moody who made the statement, I have never known the Spirit of God to work where the Lord's people were divided. So the truth is, we so often say, oh God, here is my prayer request. God, would you answer my prayer? But you and I have the opportunity to answer Jesus' prayer. His prayer would be that we would become one. And we have the opportunity at Sugar Creek Baptist Church to be the greatest advertisement for the the Holy Spirit of God, for for the gospel of Jesus Christ than any other way by our unity and our love for each other. And notice what Jesus said in verse 22 of John 17. I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. We are in a world of hatred and division and turmoil and it has no solutions. It has no answers, but we do. We have the hope. We have the solution. It's Jesus Christ. Coming to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and yielding your heart to the Word of God. And when we do, it changes who we are. The world needs our message, but it will only believe our message when it sees that it works in us. Several years ago, Kathy and I went to go visit San Francisco. We had heard about, read about, and seen stories about San Francisco, but we had never been there, so we decided we would go, and we went and spent a week, almost a week, in San Francisco. Now, I am a type A, type A, type A person, and I organize everything, and so we were so organized, and we saw, oh my soul, we saw literally everything it felt like. We had the most fun. We laughed and we played. We had the most fun going and seeing so many things. And we saw two Major League Baseball games because I was in charge of the schedule. We got the opportunity to experience everything we had heard about with San Francisco. And one of the places we went to was to go see the redwood trees. California has the two greatest trees in the world the redwoods and the sequoias. And we, in San Francisco, got to go to a redwood forest right outside of San Francisco and see those trees. They grow to be about 300 feet tall. It is unbelievable. And their their trunk is so large, you could put several, several people inside the trunk, just shoulder to shoulder. It is absolutely massive. And these redwood trees last about 2,500 years. That means that some of the redwoods that were in the forest that we saw were 500 years old when Jesus was born. That's absolutely amazing. And you would think they, they're 300 feet tall. I mean, they've got to have massive Roots. I mean, they got to go way down and way out, and, and the tap root has got to almost go to the, to the core of, of the earth. But actually, none of that is the case. 
But what we discovered is that redwood tree roots are very shallow. If you could actually take all of the dirt away in, in that forest, it would be, the site would be absolutely amazing because the roots are shallow, but what those roots do is that they tie around each other tight. It's like, they're like ropes around the other redwood trees and they go for quite a distance and they're tying themselves to other redwood trees all around them. So when a storm comes, it cannot knock down one redwood tree because it would have to knock down the whole forest. In other words, every tree is holding up every other tree. And that's what God wants for us. That our roots are tied to each other. And our love grows deep together. So what is the basis of our a pluribus unum? There's two things that tie us together. First, our unity is centered on Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united us into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Do you see what he says in the passage? Mankind, human beings have an ability to erect all these walls of separation. But the cross of Jesus Christ broke them all down. And he opened up the pathway for people who were separated by the walls of humanity to come together and lock arms together and build our roots deep with each other and a deep love and commitment of heart. Think twice before you try to now re-erect a wall of separation. After the cross of Jesus Christ broke down the wall, how dare anyone... Raise another wall. Have you noticed that when we go on a mission trip and we meet someone on the other side of the earth, the moment we find out, we meet that person and we find out that person is a follower of Jesus Christ, what happens to us? It warms our heart. There is an immediate bond that happens inside of us and it, and it does because we're part of the same family. When you accepted Jesus as your savior, you became a part of the family of God. When I accepted Christ, I became a part of the family of God and it means that we are part of the same family. And what has tied us together as one family is Jesus. There's a second part of our unity. Our unity is centered on Jesus's goal. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20, therefore go unto all, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's the goal that ties us together. A football team is a team, not because they all play the same position, they're not all the quarterbacks, they're not all the tight ends, they all play different positions, but they are a team because they have one goal, the goal line. Their their goal is to put the football across the goal line. They want to win the game. And out of their desire to win the game and take that football across the goal line as many times as they can, they work together in different positions to be as effective as possible. An orchestra is harmonious, not because they all play the same instrument, they play different instruments, it's because they play the same song. They have the same goal, the same song. It is the goal of Jesus Christ that binds our hearts together. And so here we are, from 90 different countries, from 70 different languages, 
and from every shade of skin. And God has brought us together to be one church who together pledges allegiance to Jesus and his mission. I've been told that though right now there's probably only maybe 10 churches like Sugar Creek in America, frankly, I don't think there's only, but there's just one church like Sugar Creek in America. But 10 churches like us with a diversity of our church. But did you know I'm also told that in 50 years, 75 years, that most of the churches in America will be like ours. And they'll be wondering, how do we do this? How do we make this work? How do we bring so many different people of so many backgrounds together? And how do we mesh together as one? And they'll be looking to Sugar Creek. How did you guys do that? Help us to understand how you got through this and that. We're pioneers. We're blazing a new path in this country. And I'm here to tell you, I'm in. Would you join me in letting God use this country, this, this church rather, to make an impact in this country for the cause of Jesus Christ. Would you join me? Let's pray together. Father, we come to you today and we acknowledge, oh God, you have brought us to something that is absolutely amazing. A work of you that only you could have done. And Father, we come together today and we open up our hearts and we say, oh God, we want to see what you will do in a church like this of learning how to love people that are different from different backgrounds in different countries. Father, we pray you would grow us and move in our heart to accomplish something that has only been birthed by your spirit and can only be done by the power of your spirit among us. We pray, Father, today that you would move in our hearts, deepen even deeper our love and our commitment to each other as members of the same family. And our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ and our commitment to your purpose understanding all of this through your word. Use us, Father, in a powerful way at Sugar Creek Baptist Church, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.